Life doesn't come with an instruction manual. When we're born, we have no idea what's going on. And we gradually piece things together bit by bit as best we can. As we make decisions and as we start shaping our lives. We start shaping it even before we realize what's happening. And by the time we've figured things out, to some extent, we've already made some important decisions and may have made some pretty big mistakes. By the time we come to the Dharma, we're already in the middle of all this. What makes the Dharma special is that it shows us a way out, because a lot of those muddling mistakes we make create a lot of suffering for ourselves, for the people around us. But an important part about choosing a life of the Dharma is that you're not going to let yourself be a victim of circumstances. Most people's lives, if you could draw a picture of them, would be like dust motes in a sunbeam. You see the dust moat jiggling around, going here, going there, drifting here, drifting there. It doesn't have any particular direction. The Buddha's image is of a stick being thrown up into the air. Sometimes it lands on this end, sometimes it lands on that end, sometimes it lands splat in the middle. Very little rhyme or reason, mostly pushed around by circumstances. This is important when you think about one of the principles that Buddha taught. He calls it directing yourself rightly. This, he said, is a, one of the factors of progress in your life, when you finally figure out a direction you want to go in, particularly if it's a direction toward the end of suffering. It means that you have a goal, and you're dedicated to that goal, and you're not going to let yourself get deflected from it. It's not only a cause of progress, it's also protection from all those random impulses, both inside and out, that would make us live like dust boats. When you're practicing the Dharma, developing qualities of the mind, that's one of their purposes, it's to protect you from being a victim of circumstances. So your practice doesn't have to depend on being here at the monastery or being surrounded by wonderful, inspiring people, or totally free of disturbances. No matter where you practice, there are going to be disturbances, more or less. But it's amazing how when the disturbances are small, you can magnify them. There's, the mind does have this quality, that old adage that you know, the work expands to fill the amount of time allotted to it. In the same way, disturbances expand to fill your mind's capacity to look for them. So that's one of the things you've got to make up your mind. You're not going to go around looking for disturbances or letting yourself get pushed around by them. You've got your direction. You're here to develop the, the training in virtue, concentration, and discernment, as those are your treasures, those are your protection, progress. And those things really is genuine progress. When you look at the world outside, you see so many people living their lives working on a particular cause, and then 
it all gets dashed to pieces. By a change in the economy, a change in the climate, whatever the outside influences may be. So that kind of progress is, is uncertain. But progress inside as you develop qualities of mind. That can just keep on going and going and getting greater and greater progress. So you can ask yourself, as you practice here, what is the direction you want to go in? What would be directing yourself rightly? And how does that translate into what you're doing from moment to moment? You're working on virtue. Okay, where are your precepts still sloppy? Where do you tend to slough over thing, things and say, well, it doesn't really matter? What well, does matter? Often those little careless, it doesn't matter kind of decisions, they add up. And they become a habit. So that when you try to sit down and meditate, well, this doesn't matter, that doesn't matter, this distraction doesn't matter, I'll, I'll follow it for a while, it won't do any harm. See what happens. It just eats away at your concentration. So you try to develop a habit of being meticulous. Learn how to carry that habit in a way that's comfortable. This is where the concentration comes in, to give you a sense of ease, give you a sense of well-being, give you an inner strength that's not deflected by things outside. But the concentration also has to be tempered with wisdom, discernment. Wisdom is an automatic. Just because the mind is focused doesn't mean you're going to see things clearly and rightly. You have to contemplate once the mind is still, because the mind still can latch on to all kinds of things. The concentration can get suddenly focused on something that gets you irritated, something that gets you angry. And the stronger your concentration, sometimes the stronger your anger when you come out of good concentration. You've got to watch out. John Lee has a comment. He says, the problem is you get attached to your concentration and thinks everything is fine as long as you concentrate and the world out there is bad because it disturbs your concentration. He says, well, you've got to remind yourself the problem isn't out there. The problem is inside, this tendency of the mind to get stirred up by the world. You've got to learn how to contemplate, to understand why the mind doesn't have to be affected by things outside, where it's allowing itself to be affected. This is something you actively have to figure out. You can't just have a, a mantra of let go, let go, or metta, metta, whatever. You've got to understand why is it that you let yourself get disturbed, what the assumptions are behind that. If your peace of mind is disturbed by the, the world at large, or by the heat, or by the flies, or by the irritating people around you, the heat and the flies and the irritating people, they're not the problem. The problem is why you set yourself up to be disturbed. You're the one that goes out after the disturbance. John Cha's famous quote. It's not the sound that's disturbing you, you're disturbing the sound. Well, that applies to a lot of other things that destroy your peace of mind. You want the peace of mind and you want to take care of those situations outside. You've got to make your choice, which is more important. Learn how to develop a peace of mind that's more porous, in other words, these 
disturbances and just go right through. It's like those hummingbirds that sometimes get caught in the multigoody. If they simply flew in the front door and flew out the back door, there'd be no problem. But they fly in and then they get caught. They buzz around trying to find a w window. And they'll usually choose all the wrong windows. And the same with the disturbances coming into the mind. If you could allow them just to go right through, there'd be no problem. The mind would be still, your awareness would still be aware. But you start capturing these things as they come through, and then they become a problem, and then you get upset about them. Well, what is this capturing? How do you do that? And how can you learn how not to do that? You've got to observe that. You've got to watch it. Figure it out. So the wisdom is not just telling yourself to let go. You understand what the problem was. And once you really understand what the problem is, then you don't have to tell yourself to let go at all. The mind automatically lets go. In other words, you've got to take your peace of mind seriously and realize that the problems are not outside, the problems are inside. And getting angry at the problems doesn't help, whether they're outside or inside. Getting angry at yourself doesn't help. Just simply note that there's a problem here that you don't understand yet. You stick with that determination that you want to figure out this issue of suffering. And now you've got the opportunity to do it. Sometimes you start worrying about the future. How much longer will I be able to do this? That's getting in the way. You've got right now. And you can make the decision right now that regardless of the circumstances outside, you're going to maintain your your compass, your sense of direction. You're going to keep it right. This is what it means to be rightly directed. In other words, you look for the problems inside, the cause of suffering. After all, the Buddha said, is the craving that leads to further becoming. The craving to have situation in terms of the senses just right, the craving to take on a particular kind of identity. Or when you don't like the identity you've got, you, the craving to have it destroyed. Thinking in terms of identity, that, that sets up this huge target that, of course, all the things in the world are going to come and they're going to attack, because it's laying claim that these things have to be this way and that way to maintain that identity. But if you simply look at things in terms of where is their stress right now, what's causing it? What quality is going to make that will allow me not to be a victim of those circumstances? Or if you can take the me out of there, that what qualities can be developed to stop that suffering? That's called being rightly directed. It's your protection. In other words, instead of trying to make a, a bigger you that controls more of the circumstances outside, you step out of the way. Offer them nothing to attack. It's a great passage in the canon where this one guy come in, comes to see the Buddha and he's looking for a fight. And so he asks the Buddha, what kind of teaching do you teach? And then what the Buddha says essentially is the kind of teaching whereby people don't get into fights. And the guy's at a loss for words. He, his eyebrows go up, so his forehead wrinkles, and 
four or five creases and goes away. So we're not here to get into fights with the world to decide whether it's good or bad. So we're here to solve a problem. And the problem comes from within, so we try to develop the qualities that allow us to focus on that problem within. So we're not getting into fights with anything at all. This involves contentment in an unusual way. On the one hand, you learn how to content yourself with whatever the situation is outside. But at the same time, you don't let yourself rest content with the state of your mind until it's reached the point where it really isn't suffering anymore. So as long as there's still suffering, there's still stress, there's still work to be done. Try to gather up the strengths that you can from within, the strengths of conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, and discernment. And keep them directed at that point, that you're not going to be a victim of circumstances. Your sense of direction allows you to overcome circumstances, so that regardless of where you are, your practice still takes top priority and doesn't get deflected. That's your protection.